Well, good morning, Southlake. My name is Matt, and I am the middle school pastor here. There are so many other ways that you could have chosen to spend your time, but I'm so thankful that you're spending it with us, investing in your relationship with Jesus. Now, whether you're worshiping at home, in your car, or at work, we're going to start things off with some worship. So let's kick it over to the band. Yeah. 
because of what you've done for us, because you chose us to be your children, to be sons and daughters of God. So church, let's lift our voices together. 
and I am chosen, not forsaken, and I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me, and I am who you say I am. And I am chosen, not forsaken, and I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. you join us in prayer now? God, um, we're just in awe of who you are and, and how you have met us here this morning. God, we truly are. Our identity rests in who you say that we are. We are your creation, Father. And we are so thankful that you have not forsaken us or abandoned us, and yet you are here with us in these moments, and we can come to you and we can find our purpose in you and what you have for us. And so God, thank you. Take this time of worship and learning as a time of uh, honoring you and coming back to you and realigning back to you. And when we do that, God, we find that you have amazing things for us and you lead us in ways that will not leave us void but you are with us and you are fulfilling us. So thank you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Willow South Lake. My name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited that you have joined us today. And I'm Julie, so glad that you're here. Small groups launch in just one week, and we're excited for our whole church to be on a small group journey together for our, our next teaching series. Nothing is better than community especially during increased times of isolation when spaces to process, grow, and learn are so hard to come by. We believe the intentional relationships you find in a small group are the ideal place to truly belong, celebrate the joys of life, weather the storms together, and become who God made you to be. Registration is currently open, so if you haven't had a chance to join a group yet, be sure to visit WSLathome.org. Yeah, we're really excited about this group's launch and we're also excited about what is gonna be happening on February 14th. We are gonna be offering our first live experience here in the building at Willow South Lake on that Sunday morning. It's gonna be a great time of worship and being able to get together. Of course, we are gonna have safety protocols in place because it is so important that each of us remain safe during this time. Be looking into your email or go to wslathome.org to get registered for that day and the ongoing services from there. Many of you give so faithfully to support what God is doing through our church family at Willow South Lake, and we are so grateful for that. If you haven't had a chance to sign up to do that on a regular basis or want to learn more about the ways to give, please go to wslathome.org slash give for more information. We're really excited about this series that we have been in called Game On. So we're gonna continue that series now. What's up, Willow? Thanks for joining us today as we kick off the fourth week of our Game On series. The sportsmanship between these teams last week, Lauren, was off the charts. Absolutely. And I really can't wait to see what they bring this week. Joe, these teams are really bringing their A game, and I'm sure this week will be no exception. 
Today, two new teams will be competing in our field goal kickoff challenge. In this challenge, each team will need to choose a kicker and a placeholder. And we also have Rob Campbell here on injured reserve to be our long snapper for both teams. Each team will get two attempts at kicking the ball through the goal post at the end of the field. The team with the most kick wins. All right, Lauren, give us a rundown of teams. All right, the teams for today's game will be Sean Williams and Sandy Riggs, then Nat Bodmer and Ed Ollie. We got Rob, we got Nat holding, we got Ed kicking. It's going to be fantastic. Let's go. It's a stiff breeze. Blue fire, see what we can do. Hey. Nat with the All hold, right, with the, the kick is up, and it is. Oh, just a bit outside. Wide Ugh. right. Just like that much. Wide right. Wide right, my friends. Well to the right. It's okay, though, because as I told you, you got to just dust yourself off and try again. Hiking in, we got Sandy holding it, and we got Sean, Sean kicking. kicking it. Sean is lining up his kick right now. I'm just saying, it looks like he's pretty serious. Here we go. The hold is down, my friends. The kick is up, and oh. it is. No good, my friends. That was not good. <laughs> let's, let's redo. Hey, I might need some ice for my leg after this is over. Blue 42, hi. All right, Nat with the hold. The kick is up, and it is. Oh. Wide right. Even wider than we thought. Even wider than the last one, ladies and gentlemen. Even wider. You ready? You ready? Okay, hut, hut, hike. Hike. Oh, the hold is down. Nice the kick is up, ladies oh, and gentlemen, and it oh, is no, good. No. The kick Beautiful. is good. The celebration, <laughs> nice. it is on, my friend. Love Party it. time. Incredible. Those Rob, those Sean, elbows. and Sandy. That was phenomenal. It's been a tough round for all of us. Uh, kids, don't give up hope at home. One day you might be able to kick bad field goals like me. All right, how's everybody doing tonight? Doing well? It's good to see so many of you coming out tonight. How many, how many of you have not been here in a while? Would you say it's been a while since you've been in? Yeah. Wow. Well, we're so glad that you ventured out and joined us tonight. What you just saw on the TV is a, a small example of our next vision. You say, what are you talking about? Well, the T in next was that we would be together one church. And one of the ways that we're doing that is bringing campuses together, campus pastors together, departments together, and try and work together more strategically. And there's a lot of work behind that, but we're trying to have a lot of fun behind that as well. And that's a fun example of what's beginning to happen. But I also want to share with you kind of a, an important example of one of the ways that that has happened uh, this week. Um, we got together as a staff, our all staff, where we brought all of our staff together, brought them together, socially distanced over in the other auditorium, uh, Lakeside, and uh, we said that Jesus came into the temple courts in John 2, and he up turned uh, the tables, and he had a whip, and he was chasing out money changers, and he said these words, my house shall be a house of prayer. And uh, we said that there's a lot of things that go on in God's house. There's a lot of conversations. There's a lot of fun. There's a lot of worship. There's a lot of preaching. There's a lot of music. There's all kinds of great things, and those are all wonderful. But Jesus decided in that moment to emphasize prayer. And so that group of people that were having fun on that uh, video along with your entire staff decided to get together and go out for an hour into different areas of this building and simply pray and simply ask God to move. And we went around to different departments and we said, God, would you move in students' lives? And we came in this room and said, God, would you move in this room? 
We went up to offices and said, God, be with leadership. We went over to the care center and said, God, help us to reach people in this community in, in practical ways. Father, help us to show the love that you would show. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed for an hour. And then we came back together. And when we came back together, there was a group on stage that led us in worship. And they were the vertical worship band from Harvest Church. And folks have told me that that is kind of a unique deal, that in the past there hasn't been a lot of willow and harvest coming together. And so for our staff and for their team, it was kind of a powerful moment. If they were here, they would tell you this was just sort of a powerful moment of churches coming together and working together. And we were reminded of what Jesus said in John 17, that they may all be one, one church. Working together. In fact, if you ask God, wow, how many churches in the Chicagoland area? If you ask you and me how many are in the Chicagoland area, we might get out the yellow pages or we might start Googling and say, well, there's the Methodists over there and the Baptists over there and you got the Pentecostals over there and you got the Presbyterians over there and you got Harvest over there and Willow over there and missions over there and communities over there. And God would say, whoa, 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 whoa. There's one church. It's my church. Amen. And we ought to all be working together. So I just, yeah, give it up for that. I just wanted to share with you what you are walking into today. You are walking into a house that has been prayed for. There is a new wind blowing in this place. And we welcome it and we ask God for more of it. And I tell you all that, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight. That was just all for free tonight, all right? Uh, but with that in mind, let me pray for us as we begin, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we don't ask for your presence to fill this place. We know you're already here. We just ask that we become more aware of it. Pray, God, that in a sense, uh, when Jesus said, let those who have eyes, let them see. Those who have ears, let them hear. God, help us to have spiritual eyes. Help us to have spiritual ears to see and to hear what it is that you would have for us tonight. We're talking about something so practical, God, something so everyday, and yet something that has had so much power in our lives, so much power in our relationships. And God, probably something that we've talked with you about quite often. And so, Lord, even though we're talking about something very practical tonight, I pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would infuse it with the spiritual lessons that we need to have that would cause us to take our next steps with you. God, great things very rarely happen inside our comfort zones. And so stretch us and call us to something greater and give us the courage to follow you in that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Well, I got something in the mail this week, and, and I wanted to read it to you. Now, I, I hesitate to read this because, you know, normally I don't like to, you know, toot my own horn. But this came, and I just thought, man, you, you should know the kind of pastor that you have. It starts out, dear Reverend Dummett. Obviously, they know I am a man of God. It said, congratulations, you are among the preferred, select few, pre-approved for our most prestigious credit card. <laughs> Did you hear those words? Preferred, prestigious, select few. It goes on and says, the card, this card is customized to meet all your needs. See, I thought God was supposed to meet all my needs, and I'm so glad to know that all I have to do is worry about this card. It says, enjoy spending all you want. You have set the standard higher, and there's only one platinum card that meets your needs. You deserve it. I kind of thought you would applaud for me in that moment. Like, I mean, that's a high achievement that I was able to reach, and of course, I'm being completely facetious because that's not the only time I've gotten a letter like that. In fact, I've gotten a bunch of letters like that. And you know what? I'm not special because you've gotten a bunch of letters like that, offers like that, 
fact, Visa sent one to a three-year-old one time. And MasterCard sent one to a dog one time. They try to suck us in with 0% for six months. They try to suck us in with these high credit limits, limits we can't afford. They try and say, hey, there's cash advances and all kinds of points back and all sorts of things. And it begs the question today, hey, let me ask you, where are you getting your advice on how to manage money? Where are you getting your advice on how to manage money? Jesus over in Matthew 25. Now, this is interesting to me because this is kind of like right before he's going to the cross. So the last things that he's saying, he talked about the sheep and goats. He talked about the prodigal son. He talked about some really important things. And one of the things he gives us is a parable about a business owner who, before he goes away, gives certain sums of money to three people. And there were different sums of money, and he gives them to the people, and he goes away. And the idea is that at some point he comes back, and he holds them accountable. He sees how they did at managing his money. And what Jesus points out for us is really the key to this whole concept of managing money, and that is that when it comes to our money, it's not really our money at all. In fact, it's not the only place in Scripture that that concept plays out. If you look in Haggai 2.8, it says, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. 1 Chronicles 29.12 says, Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. 1 Corinthians 10.26 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Okay, and so the gist of these verses and the gist of Jesus' parable is that our money is not really ours. It all belongs to God, and we are, we are charged with stewarding his resources, managing it in a way that hopefully when we see him again, he'll say, wow, well done, good and faithful servant. And, you know, I want to know what God has to say about managing his money. I hope I'm not going to go to Visa or MasterCard or really any financial institution. I want to figure out what God has to say, especially in a year after the year that we've had. Because this has been a year that has really put a strain on a lot of people's finances. There have been some of us who have had uh, a, a depression, who have been, had boredom, who have had to, had to deal with lots of stuff in the last year. And one of the ways that we've tried to deal with that is to try and make ourselves feel better by buying stuff. There are some of us who have taken the opportunity this year to say, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and because I want to get this done and that done, I'm going to go ahead and run up more debt on my credit card. There are those of us who have had job loss, who have had wages lost, businesses lost, entire sectors of economy hit in negative ways. Man, you better believe this is a moment where I want to see, God, what do you have to say about money? What do you have to say about your money? What do you have to say about the way that I manage what you have given me. And so that's what I want to do with you tonight. I mean, we've never talked about this before. And I know it can get a little tense in church when you talk about money in church. People kind of look at you like, oh, goodness. But I just want you to relax. I just want to give you a couple basic principles from Scripture in regards to what God would say about managing his money. And the first one is from Colossians 3, 23. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. There's a passion to the work that we should have as though you were working for the Lord, not for human masters. In other words, we ought to work hard. We ought to be hardworking people. God says no matter what what is the name that signs your paycheck? Or, 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 or no matter what the name is above you on the org chart or whoever it is that gives you your review, you're not really working for them. You're working for God. And so how much more should we work with passion? How much more should that inform the way that we do our work? Willard Pierce uh, wrote a biography of John Wesley. Any Wesleyans in the house? Any Methodists in the house. I went to a Wesleyan school. 
And John Wesley started the Methodist movement, the Wesleyan movement. And he said this, uh, Willard Pierce said, Wesley's teaching in regards to finance was very simple based on Colossians 3.23, the verse that we just read. Wesley would teach his Methodists to earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Just very simple. He said the work ethic, this is what's interesting to me, the work ethic of the Methodists became a hallmark of their movement. It was common practice for business owners to seek out Methodists because of their reputation as dependable, honest, and hardworking employees. Did you hear that? I mean, that's just a real interesting byproduct of people following God's word in regards to Colossians 3.23. And it just makes me wonder what it could be like in our cities if when we went for a job interview and they were asking us, you know, let's review your resume, tell me a little bit about yourself, and you say something like, well, yeah, you know, and in my family, our faith is really important, and your employer starts to lean in like, what do you mean? And you say, well, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, we go to uh, Willow over there. We're followers of Jesus. And they go, oh, 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 my goodness, we've had some of you Christians before. You guys have got a reputation. And, of course, now you're just like freaking out. What is he talking about? But he said, no, we've had you before because you guys are some of the most hardworking, some of the best attitude, some of the people with, with just the most integrity, you should have told me earlier on, you're a follower of Jesus, well, come on. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? That's what was happening with these people. They got that kind of reputation because they thought of themselves as working for God. And I'll tell you this, on the days where it feels like, man, I just don't even know, you know, what am I doing all this hard work for? I mean, don't you feel that way sometimes? It's kind of like, man, it's Monday again, and I'm just thinking I'm working for the weekend, or I'm just working for, you know, the end of my career, or I'm just working for me. I think there's a little more inspiration, a little more motivation when I think, actually, I'm working for God. And, and the Bible talks a little bit about a connection between hard work and financial reward. Uh, it says in Proverbs 28, 19, those who work their land will have abundant food. One man said, extraordinary people are just ordinary people who are willing to do the ordinary things other ordinary people aren't willing to do. Working hard. Proverbs 21, 5 says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit. And so we don't want to be workaholics, we don't want to go overboard, but you know what? I want to work as though I'm working for God with a passion. I want to work hard. You know what else I think the Bible would say to us, what I think God would say to us about managing our finances? <laughs> I think God would say it this way. Now give me a little leeway. I think God would say, ignore those Joneses. You know who I'm talking about? You know who the Joneses are? These mystery people that kind of live down the street from us that we're in sort of a competition with. This idea that when they get a little add-on three-season room to their home, we sort of feel like, man, we got to get a three-season room home in our house. And when they come home with a, fine, a fancy new car, we think, oh my goodness, we got to get a fancy new car. And when you're talking to them, you out get in the mail and they say, yeah, we're, we're going out to, to Europe this weekend, you know, flying out. And you're like, ah! I want to go out to Europe this weekend. Somebody said, many of us are spending money that we don't have on things we don't need to impress people we don't even like all that much. Does that sound familiar? God says, you know what? Keeping up with the Joneses is kind of pointless. You know what he says in Ecclesiastes 6? By the way, through the richest man who ever lived. I love to hear from people who have been there and done that. And King Solomon was that guy, especially when it comes to success and riches. And, and he said this, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless. It's like a, it's like a chasing after the wind. In other words, you're never really satisfied. You're never going to keep up with the Joneses because you know what? As soon as you keep up with the Joneses, oh, the Smiths move in down the street right? And it's just impossible. There's always somebody that's got a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, and it just becomes meaningless. And so 
what do we do about that? Well, what's the antidote to that? Well, I would say enjoy what you have. I would, I would call that gratitude. I would say one of the things we ought to do is to develop a discipline of gratitude. I've told you before, I get out a journal every day. I try to think of five things that I'm grateful for. It develops in you an appreciation for what you have. And then it says, and then, but rather, you know, do that rather than desiring what you don't have. And so I don't want to compare myself. Let's stop comparing ourselves to all these imaginary people around us. Because here's what it does. When you compare yourself with the Joneses, you have one of two outcomes. One is either you win and then you just feel proud, and that's not very Christ-like, or you lose and you just feel discontent, and that's not very honoring to God either. Well, how do you do it? How do you just stop comparing? Now, I have to be honest. This is where I kind of depart from Scripture a little bit, and that's okay. I just want to give you sort of my advice on how to do this. This doesn't come from the Bible, but how do I stop comparing myself to other people? One is, I just declare that Jones is the winner. Like, I didn't knock on their door. That would be kind of odd, right? But you just kind of declare them the winner. Just one day, just kind of in your mind, just go, you know what, man? You know what? You win. You just you win the house competition, and you win the car competition, and the Christmas light. The Christ, you got to see his Christmas lights. You win the Christmas light competition. Like, you just, you just win. And I think I've saved thousands of dollars by just declaring them the winner and just moving on. Another thing I do, and this is maybe less advice and more confession, okay? And I'm just being real. I'm just being authentic. Is that sometimes, because I'm a car guy, sometimes when I'm, when I'm driving down the road, I'll see somebody in a really fancy car, and I just, oh, I just have a, so I just kind of make up their backstory. I just go, hey, you know what? That guy's probably not happy. <laughs> he's, pro he's probably in debt up to his eyeballs. You know what? He's going home sleeping on a futon because he's got no money. Put all his money in that car. He's probably got an iPhone 6, you know? <laughs> and I just kind of... So again, I'm just confessing to you. I don't know if you should take that advice, but let's stop comparing and let's develop gratitude. Third thing I'd share with you is let's get wise counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 says, in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. You go to any big business, any big corporation, any big organization, and they will have a board of trustees. They will have a financial committee. They will have outdoor or outdoor outside. They might be outdoor. I don't know if it's in California or Florida. But anyway, outside accounting firms will come in and see the books. That's what we do here at Willow. We have elders, we have a finance committee, we have an outside accountant, a third-party accountant that looks over everything that we do because we want to make sure that we have an abundance of counselors because we want that kind of safety and security. We want to make sure that we're making wise decisions. And so every decision that's made around here is looked at by multiple, multiple people. And so my thought for you as individuals, if it's good enough for a big organization, it should be good enough for you. And so as you're making big financial decisions, do you have sort of a personal board of directors, people that you trust, people that you would say, you know what, I'm about to do, make a move here. It's an investment, or I'm paying down debt, or I'm going to make a tax move, or I'm going to buy this, or whatever it's going to be. Do you have some people that you trust enough to say, hey, can I run this by you? I want to make sure I'm thinking through this well. You know, I'm 47 years old, and yet I still don't make a move financially without calling my dad. I do. He's just on my personal board of directors. Do you have somebody like that, a, a small group? Do you have a, a financial counselor? Do you have somebody? You say, well, no, no, no. I always ask the credit card company if I can afford things, and I never, no, no, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. In fact, let me give you an, uh, uh, just one option. We have a um, ministry around here called Good Sense. I don't know if any of you have taken this class, but this thing is for 
decades, helped people get out of debt, get their money management under God's sort of uh, uh, principles, and it's just been really freeing and helpful for thousands of people. And if you need help in that area of your life, I would encourage you, uh, figure out a way, come sign up for Good Sense and get some of those, that wise counsel in your life. Now, let me give you another one that I think God would tell us in regards to managing his money. Okay, so this is his money. He wants me to management, manage it in a way that, 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 that would be pleasing to him. I think we ought to give a tithe back to our local church. And you say, well, I would expect you to say that because you're a pastor and we're in a church and it takes money to run the church. But I'm not really saying that because we need to pay the bills. And I know we're just getting to know each other and you don't know my heart and you don't have any real reason to trust me. But I can just tell you that if we sat down over coffee, I would look you straight in the eyes and I would tell you, I believe that this is one of the most important financial principles, not for the church, but for you. And that when I talk about giving and generosity, for me, it is not because I want something from you. It is because I want something for you. And I really believe that that's why God talked about the tithe in Scripture. It's not because he wanted something from you. The truth is God owns it all anyway. It's that he wants something for you. He wants you to be able to trust him with your money. The number 10 in scripture often has been related to tests like the plague or the 10 commandments, the tests of faith. And I think a tithe kind of fits in that mold. Now, some of your theologians, you know, say, well, hold on a second. I don't know if that's really a, a, a law in scripture. And I would say, well, I totally agree. It's a much broader concept than that. It was happening with Abraham and Melchizedek before the law was given. It was given as part of the Mosaic law. And then when Jesus came and was establishing the new covenant, Jesus actually affirmed with one of the, uh, the Pharisees, affirmed the tithe. And so if it's something that's happening before the law, during the law, and after the law, I think it's a pretty good practice for us as well, giving 10% of our income back to God. Now, I'm not the only one that thinks so. It's really interesting. David Bach, not even a Christ follower, wrote a book called Automatic Millionaire, and in it he says, give a tenth of your income away because it tends to be true. It will come back to you. Uh, we find that the most successful people are givers. It's just something that he has observed over time. I don't think he knows much about God at all. At least that's not what the authority that he was appealing to in his book. But what's inter interesting about what he noticed is that that principle is all throughout Scripture, this concept of when God gives a great challenge, he often gives a great promise to go along with it. And what God says is uh, many times when he talks about giving and sacrifice and that sort of thing, he will often follow it up with, hey, and there's a great promise that goes along with that. In Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, it says, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And you say, great, because I'm not a farmer. So that doesn't apply to me at all. But you don't say that because you're a lot smarter than that and you know that that's a metaphor, right? And you know that what God is saying in there is, you know what, put me first in your finances and you will see promises, blessings, begin to happen in your life. Now, I need to say this because we don't know each other all that well, is that you might look at me and say, oh, here we go. What you're saying is I give 10, 10 bucks and God's gonna make sure I get 11 back. And I didn't say that at all. Because I think what God gives in his promises and that blessing, sometimes it's financial. In fact, there's a lot of people that would testify that what they've done with their tithing and how God has come back and changed their business or changed their life or changed their whatever, that will happen sometimes, but sometimes God blesses in a different way. See, this is why this is something that's really passionate topic for me. Even though it's just a practical topic, it's really passionate for me because do you know that 60% of people that get divorced, identify money as one of the key reasons why. You know, there are people that are in debt up to their eyeballs and they can barely sleep at night. Do you know there are people that are swimming in money and yet feel no purpose in their life, no joy, no peace, because they haven't figured out how to steward God's resources well 
So I think the promise comes, the blessing comes, but it's not always financial. Sometimes it's peace of mind. Sometimes it's peace in relationships. Sometimes it, it will manifest in a way I've heard people say, you know what, I've had cars that I feel like because of, they've just lasted longer. In fact, you know what, I've determined that the people that owned our house before us were tithers. Because our air conditioner is 22 years old. That was kind of a joke, but maybe it was just funny to me. I just, I just look at a 22-year-old air conditioner, and I'm like, this is a miracle. This is a modern-day miracle. The thing's still going. Anyway, or how about this is the joy of giving? Just the joy of generosity. Now, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. I feel like you're getting quiet, you're getting a little tense, and that I'm stepping on your toes. So let me move on to the next point. Saving. Saving. You know, Social Security people will say that 2% of Americans reach retirement financially independent. 57% of us in the United States have $1,000 or less in savings. That's not right. That's not going to work. Jesus said the worker deserves his wages, so I would say pay yourself. You're paying everybody else. Pay yourself. Save some money. Proverbs 13, 11 says, whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. You say, I can't afford to save money. You don't understand. Yes, you can. I really believe you can. Now, I'm going to say this for about 99% of us. I really believe you can I mean, goodness, some of you are going to Starbucks. Do you know the average person spends uh, over $1,200 at Starbucks a year? The average person, when they go to Starbucks, spends between $3 and $5, right around a little over 4 about $4.20 uh, for the mocha frappa, chip a tall venti latte with a shot of estrogen or whatever goes in there. I don't really know. But they go get these coffees, and they're paying all this money. And I just think, man, you can take that $3 Every day that you're paying on coffee or through the gas station to get your pop or through the fast food line or whatever it is, you can take that $3 and put it in an interest-bearing account, maybe a mutual fund, and let's say you get 10% and you do that over 30 years, that's $190,000 just by giving up a cup of coffee every day. Or if you're one of those that spends $5 on your cup of coffee, that money actually goes to $310,000. My father would tell me when I was 12, probably when I was 12 years old, and he would say, Dave, those who understand the power of compounding interest earn it. And those who don't understand the power of compounding interest pay it. And I've remembered that ever since. I think we ought to work hard. I think we ought to give. I think we ought to save. And then I think we ought to live on the rest live on the rest. Um, Debt is so normal these days. And it's not a sin, but it is very dangerous. And if you've ever been caught in its trap, you know how scary debt can be. And can I tell you that even though it's normal these days, it wasn't always that way. I mean, I know now when they sell you a car on the car commercials, they don't even tell you what the car costs, right? Right? All they tell you is the what? Monthly payment. Because they just assume that you're going to finance everything. Do you know in 1929, there were only 2% of the homes in the United States that had a mortgage against them? Only 2% had a mortgage. 40 years later, 1969, there were only 2% of homes that didn't have a mortgage against them. And that is how quickly debt grew in the United States to become a normal thing. So now our average household in the United States has $6,200 in credit card debt. And with most credit cards just paying the minimum monthly payment, it will take over 30 years for that family to pay that off. And that's just not going to work. So what I've told you so far, I just always say 10, 10, 80. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, and it's certainly you need to run that by you know financial experts and that sort of thing, but I'm telling you just for a very simple money management, I just give 10% to God, try to save 10, and then I try to live on 80 rather than try and live on 110 or 120 or 
I just try to live on the rest. And some of you say, well, I could never do that. I could never live on 80%. Yes, you could. Yes, you could. And I know you could because you used to. I mean, for most of us in here that I'm talking to right now, if you make $100,000, guess what? Look back a few years. You used to make $80,000, and you lived on that. Some of you make $75,000 combined income. If you look back a few years, you probably made $60,000. And guess what? Somehow you eked by on that. And so I really believe now you might have to cut up the credit cards. You might have to start tracking your spending. You might have to cut down on the mocha frappuccinos with the skinny and whatever. And you might have to sell a car. You might have to cut out some subscriptions. You might have to eat out less. But you could do it. And you could get yourself to a place where you could lay your head on the pillow at night and go, you know what, God, all this money that you give me to manage, I'm putting it where it needs to go. And the last thing I'll tell you is this, 1 Timothy 6, 17, we need to trust God with our finances. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor, here it is, put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Last thing I would tell you about finances is don't put your hope in them. Don't trust in them. If I could take you on a little imagination trip, I'd ask you to think about this. You wake up tomorrow, you check your, uh, your bank app, you look in, in your bank account, and there's $100 million in your bank account. Now, how do you feel? We're at Willow Creek. Some of you are like, where'd all my money go? All right, I know some of you people. But most of us in this room would be like, $100 million? This is amazing. You'd feel happy, of course. But let me ask why. Like, just kind of analyze your thought. Is it because you go, well, now I'm completely secure? Do you look at that $100 million and go, wow, now I'm free? I have more freedom. Do you look at that $100 million and go, you know what? Now I really am somebody. And now I can do some of the things that important people do. Because here's the thing. If you're feeling those things, then you're trusting money for things that only God is supposed to supply. I don't care how much money you have. Only God makes you secure. I don't care how much money's in the bank, 100 million or, or you're in debt, 100 grand. I, I don't care how much money is in there. Only God is the one that can give you freedom. I don't care how much money is in your 401k. Only God can, uh, is the source of, of taking away anxiety and giving joy and peace. It's only God that makes you significant, that makes you somebody, that gives you worth, that gives you identity. That's not money's job. That is God's job. And every time that we take a flimsy little green old piece of paper and go, oh, we say you're the one that gives us security and you're the one that gives us freedom and you're the one that gives us, oh my goodness, you know what that is? Idolatry. Idolatry. You ever read the Bible and see somebody doing idolatry like where they have a golden calf or they have a wooden piece or an Asherah pole and you ever think to yourself, oh, 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 oh silly primitive people. Why would you ever pray to some piece of gold? Why would you ever put your hope in some wooden statue? Oh, primitive, silly people. And yet, those credit cards and that green piece of paper. Folks, I want to tell you who you can put your trust in. Let me read this one more time. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You know who you can trust? Not that stock market that goes up and down. Not that thing where I used to have a 401k and now I got a 201k. I'm not dealing with that. I'm gonna deal with the one who one night took some bread and broke it 
and gave it to his friends and he said, this is my body broken for you. And then took a cup and said, this is my blood poured out for you. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. And folks, those 12 (laughs) people around that table must have looked at him like, what are you talking about? What are you, what do you even mean? It must have sounded so strange to them. And then as he was led out and falsely accused and whipped up a hill and and nailed to a cross, then at some point, I imagine, in all that stupor and all that fear, they must have at some point said, oh, that's what he was talking about. His body broken. His blood pouring out. God, the divine, became man. He was both fully God and fully man, lived a sinless life, and then allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, and he died. And he did that so that he could, three days later, defeat sin and death, so that he could invite you and me to not have to put our hope in anything other than his blood. He invites you and I to put our faith in him. And by putting our faith in him and his work on his death and burial and resurrection, our sins can be forgiven and we can live with God forever. That's the good news. That's where I place my trust. That is a solid foundation. If you've not yet said yes to Jesus, then I invite you to do that tonight. Come find one of us after the service. We'd love to help you make that decision. Maybe you have already said yes to Jesus, then maybe your next step is to manage your resources, excuse me, his resources. Maybe for you it's saving, maybe it's giving, maybe it's trusting him in some way, maybe it's starting to attack debt. My prayer is that your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears would hear from God what your next step is is in that area of your life. Maybe for you, your next step has nothing to do with money at all. It just has to do with trusting God, maybe stepping out of the boat, taking a risk that you've never taken before, maybe getting into a small group, maybe inviting a friend to church next week, maybe for you to extend forgiveness to someone who's offended you, maybe for you to let go of that grudge, maybe for you to love your neighbor because Jesus said something about that. Hey, whatever your next step is, Pray that you have the courage to take it. Let me pray for you, and then we'll be done. God, we love you. God, we thank you. Thank you for this house of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for a place that we can become aware of your presence in a way that is powerful, instructive, inspiring, and practical. I pray, God, that you give us courage just now and wisdom to know what you would have us do and courage to do it. Father, thank you that we don't have to do it alone. Thank you that we have your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we have each other. We're family. God, I pray more and more that we would reflect your son Jesus in the way we do everything, even manage your money. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What an incredibly practical message. Whether your next step is reprioritizing your budget, saying yes to Jesus for the first time, or getting in a small group or joining a serving team, whatever it is, I want to cheer you on and let you know that we are celebrating your courage, no matter how big or how small that step may feel. Now, if you have kids from toddlers to fifth grade, then today is your lucky day. Stick around because we have family service in just a few minutes.
everyone, welcome to Family Service. You know, when you're a kid, sometimes it's hard to reach things. Sometimes you're too short to ride a roller coaster or too short to look over a crowd. Well, the person in our Bible story today had the exact same problem, except he wasn't a kid. He was a full grown man, and his name was Zacchaeus. Today, we're going to learn about how Jesus cared for him. But first, here's Hunter to share the memory verse with us this week. You must love one another just as I have loved you. John chapter 13, verse 34. Thank you, Hunter. Great job this morning. I'm so glad you were able to help. We're going to add some motions to the memory verse. Again, this is from the book of John, chapter 13, verse 34. And Jesus is telling his friends and followers what they need to do. So the first part is, you must love one another. So you're gonna go you, and must, you're gonna do a hook. Must, love, and for one another, you're gonna put your thumbs towards each other, one another, just, and the rest of it is just as I have loved you. And on the final you, you're gonna to point to everybody because he's saying you to everyone, you. So let's put it all together. You must love one another just as I have loved you. Very good. These are the most important instructions we have from Jesus, that our number one job is to love one another. So now we're gonna worship and we have a song called Love One Another. So I want you to get your friends and family and whoever's with you together and we're gonna sing about loving one another. So let's make room. And everybody up. Love, love, love one another and be kind. Be kind to each other. Hi everyone, it's Miss Sarah. Today I get to tell you an awesome story about Zacchaeus. Come on, let's go. 
Zacchaeus was very rich. He was also a tax collector. A tax collector was someone who collected money from people to give to the government, but they were also known for cheating people out of their money. If someone owed the government four coins, Zacchaeus would tell them they owed five coins and keep one for himself. And because of this, the people looked down on Zacchaeus. Oh, and there was another reason people looked down on Zacchaeus. He was really short. One day, Jesus was passing through the town where Zacchaeus lived. Zacchaeus had heard all about Jesus, and he was excited to see him. There was one problem. Everyone else was excited to see Jesus too, and Zacchaeus was too short to see through the crowd. Zacchaeus found a sycamore tree and climbed it so he could see over the crowd. When Jesus finally reached the spot where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I am staying at your house today. Zacchaeus couldn't believe it. Jesus knew his name and he wanted to stay at his house. Zacchaeus wasn't the only one who couldn't believe it. The crowd couldn't believe it either. Why would Jesus want to spend time with a man like Zacchaeus? who was a liar and who cheated the people out of their money. But Jesus changed Zacchaeus' heart, and look what he says. Lord, I give half of all that I own to the poor. If I lie to anyone, I will pay back four times as much. And Jesus responded by saying, Today salvation has come to your house. The Son of Man came to look for the lost and save them. It seems like everyone was looking down on Zacchaeus. The crowd thought that they were better than him and that they couldn't believe that Jesus wanted to be around him. Unfortunately, we can be like the crowd sometimes. We can think so highly of ourselves that we look down on other people. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Imagine that you got a perfect score on your math test for the 10th time in a row. And suddenly you start to think more highly of yourself. You think, wow, I'm really smart. And the next day, you score the winning goal at your soccer game and your team puts you on their shoulders and carries you off the field. Now you think even more highly of yourself. The next day, your teacher gives you the Star Student Award. But you're not surprised. You always try to make good choices and avoid sin. Now you think really highly of yourself. But now there's a problem. Now that you think so highly of yourself, you can't help but to look down on the people around you because you think they're not as smart or not as athletic as you. In fact, you think you're so much better that you don't even really want to be around them. That's what the crowd did to Zacchaeus. They looked down on him and didn't want to be around him, but not Jesus. To Jesus, it didn't matter that Zacchaeus was short. It didn't matter that he was a tax collector. It didn't matter that he cheated people out of money. Jesus still loved him and wanted to spend time with him. And do you know what? The love that Jesus showed Zacchaeus is the same love he shows us. And the love that he shows us is the same love that he wants us to show others. Which brings us to the big idea for this lesson. Jesus does not look down on other people, so we shouldn't either. We know this is true because he, Jesus said it himself in John 13, 34, where it says, you must love one another just as I have loved you. Hey, Promised Land and 45s. This is Mr. Jim here. Thank you, Miss Sarah, for sharing the lesson about Zacchaeus. It was a great story to listen to. How can we use this story to help us be more like Jesus? Today's memory verse was John 13, 34. Jesus said, you must love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus did not say that we just need to love those who are like us. There are a number of ways that we are different. Kids versus adults, first grade versus second grade, tall versus short, boy versus girl, small versus big, the color of our skin. But there is one thing, one thing that we all share, and it is the love of God. Jesus said that everyone is precious and loved by God. We can just look in the Bible for, in John 3.16 that God so loved the world, everyone, 
that he gave us his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believed in Jesus would not perish, but have eternal life. So let's find a way that we can show God's love to other people. It may bring a smile to somebody's face for the day, but it may be changing somebody's life the way Zacchaeus' life was changed when he met Jesus. The challenge for today's lesson is to think about how we can show God's love to someone we don't know or somebody who's different than us. So let's sit down as, with our family and talk about how we can show God's love to other people. Mom and dad, this is not only for the kids to do. Please share how you're going to share God's love with someone that you may not know or someone you know that needs God's love. The gift of God's love is not something that we keep to ourselves. No, no, it's something that we share with everyone. We've been given a precious gift, and instead of holding on to it itself, we should share it with everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Jim. You've given us a lot to think about this week. Well, that's it for us today. Until next time, bye. Bye, have a great week. I'm so glad you could join us today. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great week. Bye, everyone. Have a great week.